Превью с ним Дампленд Ярлэкс Парти Машин. Stay Survival Podcast, bringing you survival game news. Hello, folks, and welcome once again to the State of Survival podcast. Today, we're going to be talking more about Project Zomboid, and we're going to be discussing topic about the maps and what kind of things can they do with the maps. Before we jump too far into the subject, let's go ahead and actually ask our staff about how they've been doing and what they've been up to. Jarl, how has your day been and what's going on? It's been good, man. I am having the weirdest problem this year that only props up a few years. I'm getting hives for my allergies, as you can tell. <laughs> so uh, other than being uncomfortable and not being able to shave properly, it has been a splendid week. Been enjoying the weather, been enjoying uh, sitting there streaming, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Super nice, super nice. Well, what about our wonderful producer, Red Falcon? How's it been going? Busy, busy. Getting the uh, <laughs> the technical issues that we had last week all sorted um, with the help of, of Dump. And uh, yeah, just looking forward to another show. Definitely, definitely. Now, Red, a, a little while back ago, you mentioned that you had a helicopter go event going on. Uh, did that ever happen? It actually got postponed, as events that involve lots of streamers often do. So that was, uh, I was I was the last one on the list to get notified, but uh, I hit up uh, Sammy Saturday morning and he said, oh, shoot, I forgot to tell you, but uh, it, we're going to get it rescheduled, so. Oh, nice, nice. Well, folks, keep an eye out for that, because that sounds like a hoot of a fun time. And in my little corner of the world, I have picked up working on the container mod for DayZ that I have worked with on the fellow uh, content uh, creator, Marks. It's been a lot of fun, and we have been at hard work behind the scenes of the uh, State of Survival, trying to produce better and more continuous content for you guys. But why don't we go ahead and talk about today's episode and what we're truly trying to dis um discuss about Project Zomboid. Now, Jarl, the Indie Stone did do a post uh, late, or earlier this week about uh, whether or not you are uh, your best loot or your best places to uh, base at, right? They did, yes. There were a lot of really interesting questions. Uh, some people brought up options that I didn't even know were on the map. Like, like the guy said, uh, when you mentioned the church, I forgot that was even there in that city. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's just a little small church and you pretty much always miss it, right? Um, now, what actually spurred on the topic of today's conversation is not necessarily that post, but what they responded to that post about after they've had quite a few comments. And that was that they were happy that the comments kind of affirmed that their hand-designed map over procedural generation was actually a win in their book. And it really sparked a conversation inside the comments. And you know what? We, me and Jarl, both thought that other would be an amazing conversation to have with you folks. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. So, Jarl, hand-placed maps um, and design maps. What do you think about these kind of concepts? I think depending on the survival game, you definitely see benefits out of both. For example, if you were playing a survival game like Minecraft, I think the procedural generation is what gives Minecraft the never ending allure to it. You know, you never, not every cave is the same, not every location is the same, and it makes sense. But no one can sit there and say games that have that kind of map style are realistic simply based off a of map location alone. In my opinion, when it comes to Project Zomboid, I think what makes it feel like a real place is that the locations are static. You can live the life of somebody who lives in Muldra or lives in Louisville because you know where everything is and you behave like a native. You know all the hot spots to loot, and I think it's a really strong strength that this game has. You are definitely right about that, and that actually brings me to our next point before we actually touch deeply about these handcrafted maps our last live stream actually had us 
going to places that we actually knew as outside players, but also would be things that our characters would know in our live stream. We made a run to the gas station. It was kind of an interesting situation. Yeah, uh, we were. So we've been tormenting the streamer uh, Dimension One One Nine. Uh, shout out to him, by the way, who who plays Gramps, and he has never once said that he owned a gas station. But the running joke is that Tump and I kept on insinuating that he had, in fact, run a gas station. Uh, so then, just by brute force alone, that became the lore. And once we restarted our game and we decided to go into Louisville, I'm like. I want this to be our base. That makes sense for the doctor because it's near the hospital. But I also know where there's a gas station nearby. <laughs> it was so funny. I, I remember. I, I remember last live stream. We kept telling him that we're going to go to the gas station because he owns it and he might be able to help us out. And he kept saying, I don't own a gas station. I don't own a gas station. And you said one thing that made me lose my gut. And you're all like, then why are you wearing the gas station t-shirt? Right? <laughs> Why did I mean, it like, look it like he worked there? All time. <laughs> I mean, that's like wearing a Walmart shirt and then standing in Walmart. Oh, uh, I don't work here. <laughs> then why are you wearing a Walmart shirt in a Walmart? <laughs> oh my gosh. But it was definitely interesting because we definitely were able to go around and explore these places. And honestly, there wasn't a lot of uh, Chang and stuff. Oh, it looks like uh, we actually have the the uh, mysterious dimension. One of Gramps himself, comment. right? Yeah, Gramps himself. Bro, I think we're on Gramps. Forcing uh, gas onto me. <laughs> Listen, we've eaten enough dinners with you around a campfire to know that we didn't force that gas onto you or out of you. You did that all on your own. Oh my gosh. Uh, but. You know what's cool about this live stream is it did highlight, in my opinion, how well placed and how much effort has gone into building these sort of towns and the entire handcrafted map of Project Zomboid, which is an interesting thing because the devs have already stated that they're very pleased about the fact that they chose to go that route. Yes, and I, I think it really, I think it really solidifies what they're trying to create. You know, I, I actually commented to this tweet and I said, well, because a lot of people are like procedural, 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 but I don't think they realize what they'll lose if they do a procedural map. It makes total sense to me that as a local, you'd say, hey, I know where to get an, an, a wood oven. You know, I know where to get this supply. I know where to get a generator. We should go to the lumber yard because I know we can find these items. Because when you think about games like Resident Evil, all those zombie horror games that kind of have paved the way that weren't stuck in the middle of nowhere. It was very good to see like Leon being able to communicate with the other survivors and say, I'm going here because I know this is there and it makes it realistic. Um, another good example is when you watch Walking Dead, right? Rick Grimes is clearly not from Atlanta. When he runs into the middle and hides in the tank, Glenn radios to him, and Glenn has a very good sound idea on where things are in Atlanta because they're from there, and that really does make a lot of sense. Yeah, you're very much right, but let's go from a perspective of you're new to the county, which because it is Knox County, you just moved into your home, and maybe you've been there for maybe a week or two, maybe a month. Your character wouldn't be very familiar with the map now, would they? Now, Knox County overall is a pretty large area with tons of uh, little small hamlets all the way up to big cities. So that's a kind of interesting aspect that uh, I thought was interesting because even if you go with what I just described, playstyle wise or even mentality wise, there is so much stuff that actually makes sense for a town layout. And I actually enjoy that. Now, you might be able to get that with uh, procedural generation, but the choice to do a hand-designed map actually plays really well into that because procedural generation may not make it very well, right? Like, I don't know if yeah, I'm making a lot of that was, sense. Yeah, that was something that I kind of brought up. You know, one of the things, we're just going to use Minecraft as an example because it's, everybody's played it. They can all kind of relate to this. But one of the first things you might do is look for a village, right? Well, nobody hates it more if you're the builder, because that's what I am. I want to build a really beautiful town. I want to build awesome structures. 
Nothing is more immersion breaking than seeing a giant canyon throughout the middle of town and then the town segmented onto five different areas. Or one time I was found a town, one half of it was the jungle biome, the other half of it was the desert biome. And it was very bizarre to see the stark contrast in design. And like we were talking, one of the flaws that could happen in Project Zomboid is you could be in the middle of a rural town or even a city and see fields in the middle of the city next to skyscrapers, next to trailer parks, next to graveyards, next to grocery stores. And that layout that close together doesn't really make sense. It's it's not authentic and it's kind of immersion breaking at that point. Fair enough, fair enough. However, there are real life examples of people building in almost kind of weird places. But overall, I think that we live in a modern world with modern times. And even if cities are only like 100 years old, they were still planned out to be not necessarily the most optimal, but they were planned. They just weren't naturally right. created like we would see with ancient civilizations with some of the uh, people down in Mexico or the top part of South America where they're building the cliff sides and other places. They all had their purposes for doing that, but you don't see that in like, you know, three to 400 years back, you see a lot of planning going on. So that's kind of the thing I really enjoy about some of their hand design uh, aspects is that again, it feels like it actually would have been a town. Yeah, there have been, there's a couple things that stand out, but I think that would be a more of a, they didn't upgrade or they didn't bulldoze it to modernize it or whatever because they didn't feel a need to at that time uh you could find some like old remnants of like the town you know being left behind and then you can see the newer parts of the towns that's pretty cool what's your favorite town of the entire map Yarl? i don't really have a favorite i think they all draw on different strengths but i'd have to say Riverside, because I play with a lot of new people, it's a little easier for them to get to know. But if you're looking for a lot of places that have a variety, probably Rosewood, because there's so many points of interest in Rosewood. And it's not like being stuck in the middle of Muldrow or Louisville. Louisville. Sorry, I don't want Earl to get mad. Uh, because <laughs> if you look at those cities, it just can be too much, especially for a small group. Definitely, definitely. I think my favorite uh, town, and I'm not even sure if this is a really town. It feels more like a kind of like a pit, a, a trucker pit stop that got turned into like a little bit of a community it is mm -hmm. right in the center of a map. It's right next to a big lake, but it's one of my favorite places to go to. Uh, and it's because the towns, houses and stuff are spread so far apart that you don't get too much population density of the zombies and stuff in the area. But I would actually like to pose a question to our chat. Chatters, do you have a favorite location in Project Zomboid? And uh, where is it? Uh, let us know. And let us know what your favorite part of that town is and why you always go there. Multi-stage question, but you know, pick and choose what you want to answer. But yeah, I think this kind of is cool that they are very proud of their map because honestly, I think Project Zomboid's map is pretty well done overall. I agree. And then if you go to, what I really love about it is if you're trying to see what they're planning and how they're expanding, even if you're new to the game, I highly encourage you open up on a separate monitor or on a tablet device, the uh, Project Zomboid map project. It's phenomenal. But if you actually open that up now, you can see some of the expanded areas that they're potentially working on. Areas that they've started to design that are off the grid out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and I really enjoy that about the game so much because you get how big it is. Oh, uh, Graham's favorite is the grave. Apparently he keeps visiting that place a lot every session. Uh, I think that's oh, a little thank generous. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dimension, yeah, thank you we've very, never very put much, you to Dimension grave. 119. We've never Aww, put you to grave. We, we You're in a pile. We have <laughs> one grave. The rest of the Gramps are in a pile. <laughs> uh, definitely, definitely. Uh, no, not to ignore this, but modded maps or modded expansion maps for uh, Project Zomboid. Have you ever messed with them very much, Earl? I have not, no. 
Now, I have a little bit, and you know what? Honestly, with the assets that people are given, or even, ooh, it looks like we got another one in from Always Streams. Door Kickers 2 has a version of procedural generation for maps, and it adds endless replayability. But I find there are very clear patterns and rules it follows to point to the point they don't feel different. Oh, that's good. Very true. Yeah. Very true. Um, but real quick, back to our modded map situation. They're actually really good with the, um, the assets they're given. And sometimes even these modders even expand upon the assets they have. It, it actually sometimes makes the game feel really cool. Now, as far as I know, they can't expand too far outside of a certain boundary size, but they can add in new locations on the maps. Like, I believe uh, one of the major locations is a big city in the southwest part of the map that they added the entire big city. Uh, it was a custom modded map. And it honestly feels really good. It feels kind of like, uh, not necessarily as big as, how do you say it, Louisville? Louisville? Louisville, Louis Louis? I believe is how it's supposed to be pronounced. Yeah. Louisville. Louisville. Oh, Louisville. Louisville. I, I, we just got yelled at, folks. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, that's the amazing part of all this is that when people take the time, effort, and energy to make these maps, they can be just as good as procedural generation maps. Yes, you don't get that flair where every time you boot up the map, you have a new type of map to explore. But there are many types of ways to explore procedural generation in different ways than you might think, folks. We're going to go over to our hot takes first before we talk about that, because you know what? Hot takes are awesome. All right, folks, it's the hot take hot takes hour. Woohoo! I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> that was totally weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, not weird uh, at all. Many folks never do that again. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, all right. So our first talk to take today is from the producer himself, Red Falcon. Hey, 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 hey. So yes, um, I've been doing some research on a new video we're going to do about uh, different survival games that we recommend. And one of them that I hadn't played before was Rust. So... I got Rust spun up, and uh, uh, Dump was uh, nice enough to jump in with me and, and play along. Um, it seems like it had been a while since he played, so we were kind of rediscovering it together. But uh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's definitely different than DayZ in some ways. In some ways, I really like the survival, the pure survival aspects, um, and just trying to get get things started. Um so, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, definitely some things on the downside, too, as far as uh, I was telling Dump Graw, the cinematics look fantastic. Um, and even compared to uh, to DayZ, they're, they're really nice, really pretty looking. Um, but then some of the other uh, animations and graphics are uh, fall clearly into the janky category. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking at my player's feet as I'm walking around, it's kind of like... Uh, a cross between sliding on ice and floating in the air. So uh, some yeah. things to things to improve on. But uh, overall, I've been really enjoying it. Oh, man, nothing is better in Rust than when you sit down with a buddy and you're like, let's play Rust. OK, and you're at that naked rock stage and you're sitting there like <laughs> mm -hmm. figuring it out. And then an uh, Apache helicopter comes over the horizon and lights you up. It's just so much fun. That was, uh, I had a moment where it was like, oh, the attack helicopter, and I'd found a gun. So let me take a couple shots at it and see if I can knock it down. And uh, that was not a wise move, especially close to the base. So I ended up oh, uh, getting Dump and I now. killed and uh, destroying a bunch of stuff in our base because we hadn't added a roof yet. Uh, if you ever have a chance, Red, the funniest videos I've seen is when it goes, they shouldn't have messed with me or whatever. It's it's kind of a trend with Russ, but you'll get somebody who gets gunned down by a fully geared player when they're naked. And then they walk up to that fully geared player's base and they're like, you shouldn't have done that. And then 50 <laughs> naked people run over the hill and just start whacking on the base with rocks. It's the greatest. <laughs> I love it. That's classic. Oh, that's that's crazy. classic. Yarl. What's your hot take, buddy? You know what? This is kind of funny that I chose this because of something Red mentioned. He mentioned the survivability. 
I think that there are two types of threats when you play survival games. There's the environmental threats, and then there's the hostile enemy threats, right? So my problem with most survival games is they focus on the enemies, whether it's zombies or mutants or other players, and they don't focus enough on Mother Nature. And the thing about Mother Nature is Mother Nature is very, very cruel. She's unbiased. She does not pick or choose who dies with any kind of style, but it's very cruel. And I would love to see more survival games tap into that. I'm not just talking disease or survival needs. I'm talking if it's going to rain for two days straight, what about flash floods? What about tornadoes? What about other natural events that we have to worry about? Um, if, if it's a game that requires sleeping, but it's in a jungle, having to be woken up every two hours because of mosquitoes, there's little things they could do to make the environment itself an enemy. I'd really like to see more games kind of feature that. Definitely, definitely. I can see environmental stuff in most survival games or even just any game being almost secondary in nature to, like you said, the prime entity. So that's a, that's a good take. I like that. Definitely. Now, if you mentioned flash floods, what else would you like to see happen for environmental problems? Like just being creative. Well, we always see heat and cold, but never humidity. And the thing about humidity is humidity can dehydrate you just as fast as a desert, but you don't feel it because you feel like you're still sweating because your sweat doesn't evaporate as much. There's little things they could do. Droughts, sandstorms. Um, I'd like, I would love to see more sandstorms in desert themed maps, but just untapping that potential of crossing a stream easy one day after a thick rain. Now it's a raging river. They don't have to change too much of the game. It can be something that's programmed. Okay, when it rains this much, the river is this tall. But it's still something interesting that makes the world feel dynamic and makes it look like Mother Nature is enemy number one. Very interesting. Very cool. I like I like some of those ideas, especially the humidity thing. I didn't know that about humidity, especially where I live, humidity being a pretty high percentage in my area. So that's good to know, actually. Yes, I was playing with a screwdriver, folks. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm being scolded I'm by Linus Tech Tips about not buying his screwdriver. I love that. Just throw uh, it at me. No, I don't want to hurt my monitor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. Well, my hot take is actually something that Project Zomboid, or rather, I have noticed Project Zomboid has started doing again. And that is actually doing the community spotlight once again. This is really cool because being a DayZ player and lover of the community spotlights, I love seeing people in the community being shouted out and highlighted by the devs themselves and not just going, oh, that's cool and ignoring their content. Like this community spotlight was talking about all the cool places people have found to bid, build. They didn't only go over Twitter, Steam, but they also went over the Reddit and all those other cool areas. And it's nice to see them doing that. Then they also featured a video where somebody did a Project Zomboid animation short, which is them fully rigging and animating the character. Mind you folks, these characters don't have a lot of complexity to them, but just the effort and time this person took into making this and the fact that Indie Stone, the developers of Project Zomboid, even recognizing this person actually did this and giving them a shout out is just mwah. I love it. I absolutely love it. Here is the link if you guys are actually interested in looking at the community spotlight. That's my hot take. You know, if you really like oh. that stuff too, one of the things I recommend, um, there is a YouTuber named uh, Rix Detrix, and I'll go ahead and put it here. But he just recently uh, released a video where um, it's a news report of Knox County and the infection, but it's done with AI, but it's done with 1994 news footage, which I actually thought was really amazingly done. I don't know if he created it or not, but that's where I saw it first, and it was very well done. Nice. Very, very nice. I was just trying to link that for us, but... Yeah, and uh, so, folks, that is our amazing and also fun hot takes. 
Let us folks know what your kind of hot takes are also in the comments. And don't feel free to actually put them right here as well on our live stream. But let's go ahead and move on to our next subject in this awesome topic. So we got down and dirty and talked about the beauty and the majesty of the time and effort it takes to make hand design maps. But procedural generation actually doesn't mean that the devs are lazy or not willing to do the work. In fact, it almost means that they might actually put in more work than most people think they do. Now, Yarl, what do you think about procedural generation overall? I actually think it's a very strong tool. Procedural generation, that was one of the things I played with when I was going to school. It is a very handy tool, but it takes a lot of rules. If you get the rules right, I think you could make in a world that never ends. If you were to walk in a straight line, it would feel like a total immersive world. You would be <laughs> encapsulated in different environments and it could fit a theme and it could fit a story. If you say this is a city area, it could randomly generate the city area. You could even go as far as saying, if there's a hospital here, put these built, you know, these buildings are allowed next to it. You can establish a lot of hard coded rules to make the procedural generation more closely to a static design map. But I think the problem with that is, oh, we got one here. Ah, Lieutenant General Zombie says the best game I've seen that uses uh, pregen is No Man's Sky. There are billions of planets in that game that are generated randomly, but there's some repetition, but it's very minimal. And I agree. I think that is one thing that No Man's Sky does very well is that even though it's procedurally generated and you may notice hints of some familiarity, you still feel like they're different planets. Um, and realistically, when you think of planetary structures and the elements needed to create life, a lot of them would still operate the same. A photosynthesis plant would still have leaves that encourage photosynthesis. It would still be something recognizable to you, even if it's a different color or a different shape. So, and I like seeing that stuff right there. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Now, you have had a lot of experience with procedural generation, or at least used it as a tool when you were up and learning about it. My experiences with it, I would say, firsthand are a little bit non-existent. But what I've been told and slash what I've been read about is that you're right. It's a lot of rules and guidelines they have to follow. However, it can get pretty complicated what they have to actually really decide to do. Um, in these situations, correct? Like, for example, um, they have to, like, for biomes, like, uh, let's say, uh, Minecraft, for example, they have to make sure that their grass and their uh, forest biomes um, almost mesh pretty well. It, like, they almost have to create, like, a new biome where the grass and the forest biome almost allow each other to work together where there's a couple of trees so it looks like the forest is slowly thinning but you can also see the change of like the grass texture instead of the deep dark wood uh grass as well and it's kind of interesting about how those overall work right yeah uh there like i said there are different rules you could do on it but the one thing if you're trying to add lore which they are trying to add like notes, scripts, pictures, things that link locations to people, it becomes a little more difficult. Not impossible, but a little more difficult. The other problem is just a non-standard form of um, entertainment. When you play in a procedurally generated map, one of the biggest concerns that game developers have is, will the person have the same takeaway from this experience that they would in every other time they play. And that's not always the case with procedural generation. I mean, even in Minecraft, I don't like to use creative mode at all. Sometimes I'm stuck in a situation that just has so little resources devoid of villages that it gets frustrating when I have to run around that much that I'll just scrap the seed, start over. And it's fine that you can do that, but there are risks to it. No, oh, you're totally right. You are totally right. And it's overall a important fact for us to remember is that procedural generation, again, like you all said in the very beginning, has rules and guidelines that are predetermined by actual people putting them in. They're not 100% just... Oh, it looks like we got a actual message in. So it looks like Lieutenant Jin Zombie once again says, on the other side of the spectrum, seven days to die, 
is pre-gen, but you can see the repetitive over and over again. Even in the same town, you'll see the same buildings with the same layout, just a few feet away. Now, I think he says this in comparison to his last comment from uh, No Man's Sky. Mm -hmm. And I agree and with you know, that. you're totally right. Yeah. And there are, see, I'm a fan of the hybrid. And what I mean by hybrid is what I call the RNG map. And it's where all the houses are predetermined, all the locations are predetermined, but the layouts inside of them can be procedurally generated. I know sometimes the loot tables are, but there's still points in which you could say, I know generators spawn here. Much like the professions vans that they're releasing where an electrical van will have a higher chance of giving you a generator and tools. There is a way where you might go, hey, I know of a house that's fully stocked. Let's go there. So you travel several blocks with your friends. You get to the house, you find out the door's locked, but then you open it up and no one's moved in yet. It's completely barren. There are ways that they could potentially put some RNG into the map to make it feel procedural without making the map itself procedural, if that makes sense to you, Dump. <laughs> no, and that, that totally makes sense because you're totally right. Not everything has to be procedural. For example, folks, I hate to bring this up, but we're going to say it. Loot boxes in games like Call of Duty and whatever, although I don't necessarily find them to be very interactive and I don't necessarily like them, they do actually open up the subject. The outside of the loot container is the exact same every time you go to open it. But the random RNG inside of it is what gives you the item that you most crave or don't crave. Uh, it's a win or lose situation. So what Jarl's talking about, I totally get. You're saying that uh, not every single house is going to always have the same inside layout. The kitchen might be somewhere different. The bedroom might not be there. It may be empty or full of loot. It might be a survivor house, which we all love to find. Mm -hmm. But overall, it's a cool way to handle it because... It, it's not true procedural generation in the way that most people think about where it like develops an entire world, but it is a procedural generation in its own class, which is really cool in my opinion. But that does bring us up to the next subject. They, I think they are already considering this with basements. Now, the basements are going to be a range of basements that they're going to choose from. And I believe they have stated inside this article I just linked where the basements are going to correlate to the size of the house above it or maybe a little bit bigger or smaller but they're still going to be you know comparable and the layout of them is actually going to be a little bit different i believe yeah i think that as long as it follows the bounds of this is the basement for this house and it's not i mean i could understand having maybe an extension for a cellar entrance on the side but as long as it's not like you go into the basement of a house and you find it's a warehouse as long as they limit it with the rules, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Give us that experience of, ooh, it's different. But you know what game does it really well that I'm kind of hoping comes from the basements? Fallout. And you all know what I'm talking about. When you're playing Fallout 3, for example, you go to that super duper mart that's just northeast of, uh, of or no, it's southeast of Megaton. Yeah, either you show up there and there's bandits, super mutants, death claws, and alien ship crashing they could bring those random events to the static map as well so we get those procedurally generated basements we get those random events on the road the idea is to create the illusion that you never know what to expect while still stuck in the confines of the static map and i think procedurally generated basements really give us that option there are some boundaries but you never know what you're going to find downstairs so uh, would you be up for the occasional finding of a prepper's basement where they've expanded upon it themselves? Maybe there's some shoddy construction in the background or whatever. Absolutely. Maybe even a tunnel, you know, leading from the basement to another structure. That would be exciting to me. And it doesn't really break the immersion. There are a lot of YouTube videos of people doing that, actually, where they dig a tunnel underneath their home and they have a big, you know, doomsday shelter or like a man cave there's a lot of ways that you could handle that um and i i would love to see that because it makes sense that a paranoid guy in kentucky who's like the government's gonna be our downfall would be spending his good decade of his life building an expansive basement network but i wouldn't want to see that in every other house i would want it to be special something to get excited about yeah definitely and you know what i would love to see 
is I would love to see in some of the older towns like West Point or even in some of the older areas of like uh, Louisville, 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 right? Louisville. Um, yeah, Louisville. Louisville. Um, like, what if, okay, I, I, I know this is a little bit weird, but folks, there actually used to be access to the sewers through old storage uh, cellars. Um, and that would be kind of cool to see where like, there's a door that leads into the sewer system. It, it, it could even be like it's an old sewer system that's been abandoned. Like they didn't actually repurpose it. They kind of just built around it or whatever. But it would still be kind of cool to see that kind of situation because they actually exist. And it's really cool when you find them. Because when you open that, oh my god, the smell that comes out of that place is just nasty. But it's still cool. <laughs> and I also think sewers are important. I always tell people the most important invention to mankind was sewer systems. It's the one thing that has propelled most successful societies is having a functioning sewer system. But then when you talk about common things that we're dealing with nowadays, where we have like an ex excess of a homeless problem and things like that, I could totally see them taken to the sewers if an event like this ever occurred. To see tent cities in the sewers, to see people putting up barricades so that they can make their own little survival area in the sewers. I also see them failing so that when you go down there and you see a wall and you're like, oh, we're about to find a survival camp in the sewer. But then you realize they've all been turned. That's so cool. No, that is definitely very, very cool. And, you know, I just love these kind of topics because one of the things that I think a lot of people don't actually know is that there's actually a build limit in uh, Project Zomboid on how far you can go up. Um, and they actually plan on expanding that with basements. They plan on actually having higher areas to build and stuff. And it's just interesting because this allows not only for the subject we talked about with random basements and possibly random house layouts, but it expands upon it because some people may not always have the same kind of layout they have on the bottom floor as they do the top floor. And it'd be interesting just to see having all the insides of houses be a different layout if you choose to. And if you and check the Thursday, uh, the Thursday blogs, they're also, while they're doing that, going to be expanding the vertical limit as well. So there's a good chance we might see small office buildings that are seven stories tall. You know, that's something that I think the game is missing, uh, is that cap of verticality, because I understand that Kentucky is, you know, flat, so it's natural for cities to sprawl out far and wide. But with the advent of cars and transportation, verticality is important for a city. So I'd love to see that go both ways and see what they do with it. Oh, yeah, and you're, you're totally right about that because it's just, in my opinion, very important to be able to feel that kind of overall situation. But, you know, there's lots of cool things to think about. But when we're still on the talk of procedural generation, do you think that Indie Stone's going to use procedural generation for their wilderness maps? Because they did say they're going to be giving us an option for the wilderness map, didn't they? You know, I've been so I've been watching them, but I've also haven't been taken a lot of what they say. I've been taking it with a grain of salt. Not that I fear they won't deliver, but I want the wilderness to truly be a surprise. And with everything they're talking about with expanding it with the new fishing system and the fishing meter being almost like a mini game, uh, the hunting in general and just providing more survivability in the wilderness that i could see being completely procedural generated you know you may stumble upon a hunter's cabin in one playthrough but then if you go out there the next time there's there's a small pond there instead that i would love to see because it would give us our static map where it matters but give us our procedural generation where it's not as critical yeah and that's very true and that's very true if they ever do do the idea of adding in random layouts and houses and other buildings, it would be cool if the indie dev included a on and off switch in the server configuration on whether or not that actually would happen. So there could be technically the old layouts that they have, or there could be uh, 
the switch that allows it so the layout changes every time you boot up the map, map in a new server or reset the map or whatever. But there was one last thing I wanted to talk about procedural generation, Jarl. You brought this up, and I thought this was really cool in our talk about today's episode. One of the things you pointed out is procedural generation could also change not only the layouts of the houses, but also not necessarily the type of house that would be there, but whether or not it would be burnt down or not. And that was kind of an interesting aspect about that, because it really would change, like you mentioned, how we handle, uh, how we survive. Breathe. And, oh gosh, it's kind of like, with procedural generation, I think anytime you approach it, you can't have a predefined strategy. You have to see what's available to you before you strat like come up with your survival plan. And that is a key component a lot of games are are missing that don't have procedural generation. When you play in Shinaris and DayZ, you have a strategy pre-planned. But if you know you're about to enter a procedural area, it can change survival entirely. You have no idea what you need. You have no idea the the how uh resource heavy the area might be or how resource starved it might be and it always keeps you on your toes which i think is key no you're you're, you're totally right and one of the things you pointed out was that you may start a game playthrough and you may come across a place that you absolutely love to go and loot and guess what it's burnt down yeah you can scavenge through the burnt down remains and maybe find a rifle maybe not whatever that you would expect to find there but it changes your entire gameplay and it switches it from being a i'm just playing another game again to a oh well we're going to be uh moving on to the next house or maybe this throws them off maybe this really throws a wrench in people's gameplay and i just love that kind of i wouldn't say it was 100 percent procedural but more of a randomness to a situation which is pretty cool in those kind of situations right yeah, and with a random too, because you brought up the wilderness having like a, a setting that maybe you could change, there would be a simple way they could do that. Anytime you create a world, have a seed that is the default seed and then have it to where you could delete that seed and put whatever seed you want to where you get more randomness based on how you want to run the server, which I think would be cool. You could even look up seeds that are really popular online and give those a try. It'll allow you to have that procedural generation, but still have the confines of going, oh, I really like that. I'm going to try that seed. No, that's a really good suggestion because they do it all the time in Minecraft or Seven Days to Die or so many other games out there. Even Rust has a form of procedural generation with that kind of situation. However, you know what I would really like to ask? I would really like to ask our producer, Red, real quick about this because he actually has quite a bit of experience in coding itself. I want to see what his take on procedural generation is. I think that, uh, <clears throat> I mean, you guys hit hit on a lot of the high points, which is, um, you know, it, it can be very powerful. It can be very complex to do it properly. Um, and you can end up with some very repetitive um, uh, environments if you're not careful but i've seen some uh, some demonstrations of how it was used in some new games that are currently under development that are um you know first person shooter um modern type things and the whole idea is that it keeps you from just memorizing the map and the paths to go clear out um, houses and strongholds that it becomes much more of learning the process for clearing a room rather than just the memorization of it and that that adds a whole nother element to you're going into a you know into a village in Afghanistan or something and uh, uh, I think that was what they were demonstrating and that you're not just again it's not just an on rails experience it's very much you have to be trained properly and you have to work with your team well and to me that really that gives a very very extended lifetime to a game where if it's more preset and you're just following patterns and you're memorizing it um once you're done memorizing it and and getting through it, it kind of the the thrill is gone yeah that's true sure, I mean, when you're playing DayZ, for example, and you see the log cabin that has the big uh, fireplace in the little or the big fireplace in the bedroom and a little stove out in the living room, you know that layout so much that you immediately know which corners to check just in case somebody's in there. Exactly. And having that tactical element would definitely catch people off guard because 
not everybody is a very tactical player when they play survival games. So having a team, even if you don't have the best gear that checks the left while the secondary person comes in, checks the right. And then once they're in position, you move more to the left. That can really spur a different experience. So that's a very good point. Yeah. No, oh, that, that's all really good points. And I'm really happy to hear from Yarl and Red and also be able to get by a bit on the situation. But folks, let's go ahead and see what the community actually thinks about the design of a map versus the procedural generation. So, like normal, we are doing our community response. And this is actually a very important segment, folks. I hope you folks all enjoy this because not only in live chat can you give us your community response, but also in our comments, you can also comment down below and let us know what you feel about it, even after the show is just aired. So overall, I think that most people are, I guess, intrigued slash very suggestive of what they think could be more beneficial for maybe the procedural generation side. Now, I think that this is an interesting take because some of the comments highlight that maybe the community understands procedural generation from what they've experienced playing games, but they've never looked into it a little bit further. And then some of them actually point out some of the cases that actually might be beneficial. So. That's kind of interesting overall because it doesn't necessarily show the community is out of touch with what procedural generation is. It just more or less shows that maybe that the term procedural generation isn't displayed pretty well to most people. Yeah, it's kind of vague. It's like when you think of, uh oh, Earl? Uh oh, hey, Earl. Oh, okay. Oh, Make you know, that's a good point. Well, Earl's got a good point. I mean, how is he supposed to find food and track down living prey if everything's different every time he walks into a new city block? You know, I never felt pity for zombies before, but Earl, I feel bad for you. Hey, Earl. Uh, I, I have something for Earl right here, okay? Get good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 oh. uh, uh earl we can't say that on youtube so i'd really pre just clean your mouth out a little bit you know sorry <laughs> earl, what's, what's the most ex mouth. what's the most exciting thing that you've seen in a procedural generated map <laughs> yeah see even i don't even think oh okay that's a good point I don't even think Earl knows how true procedural generation works. I'm sorry, Earl. I don't know what to say. But no, Earl does bring up some good points. I'm agreeing with you, Earl. Calm down. Oh, my goodness. All right. Pipe down, Yarl. Pipe down. Let's go ahead and take a look at how actually some people have reacted. And um, before we do, one thing I want to let the community know, we do look at your community responses. And in fact, with our playthrough of Project Zomboid, one of the things that Dump and I have discussed is we're going to change our survival strategy to be based on how you guys voted on how you would build your bases. So we're going to go out and make outpost style bases all over the place and we're going to migrate when we need to so your feedback actually directly kind of influences our play as we give your guys' strategies some tries yeah definitely we love community feedback it's one of the ways that we not only can we grow but we can also test out new things to discuss and talk about and also engage you folks as well i love that kind of stuff so let's go ahead and actually look at what some of the people said on twitter which is uh, it should be a mix of procedural generation and design maps. Key locations can be crafted and uh, secondary one generated. That's very interesting because Less. it kind of hit on what we were talking about with merging the two or what you pointed out rather, but they actually um, offer a new perspective. Key locations and the secondary ones are generated. So like houses and other places like whole neighborhoods could be randomly generated, but like the church, gas station, the motel, and uh, mold growl, all that stuff could be static. 
Yeah, absolutely. You could have your static points of interest, but I think even then that's flirting with a little too much of what well, we already know what's there. You know, you're going to be aiming for those points of interest. But I think the good point that they make is that imagine having your core cities be static, but everything else in between being completely procedural. You might even run into a whole town that didn't exist on another playthrough that you did that could give you that spice of life. Oh, definitely. And you know, don't they have like some of those um, like survivor camps and broken down Jeeps or other kind of random events that can happen in between towns and stuff? They do. But from what I've noticed, if you know there's going to be a car collision in an area, most of the time that I go there, there is a car collision. It's just which cars are involved might change. I'd like to see something that totally catches me off guard. How cool would it be to be going down the road in your car and then you see the road is closed the road is missing in a section and it's just gravel and now it's dangerous to drive your cart over there because they were doing construction on it that would be kind of a fun random event that they're just kind of missing out on right now fair enough but y'all they already have that it's called the edge of the map i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> uh we gotta get uh grams to go up to the edge of the map and just tell them pass these roadblocks is salvation <laughs> <laughs> You're going to find your gas station there. <laughs> I don't draw in it. Ain't got um, no gas in it. <laughs> okay. The next co the next uh, Twitter comment was, Only the Brothers Adams made procedural generation truly sing, and even the Dwarf Fortress, it's a roll of the dice whether you'll get through something interesting or janky. Now, at first glance, I thought they were saying the Brother Adams were the Dwarf Fortress developers, but that's not... I don't think that's true. I don't know who the Brother Adams are, but I do know Dwarf Fortress, and Dwarf Fortress has an amazing procedural generation. Mind you, they're not working with the same graphical interface as other people, but they still have amazing stuff uh, for procedural generation. Their newest theme edition definitely shows how procedural generation can really look in their games with, with, with OK graphics. So I yeah. Well, okay, <laughs> Honestly, you also see that with RimWorld. You could procedurally mm. generate a world in RimWorld. There are still rules to how the topography is developed. And every time I play RimWorld and I enter a different, you know, seed in, I get a completely different experience. And it doesn't feel like it breaks the game, uh, which is really cool. Yeah, definitely. I'm just, uh, I just Googled it really quick. And I don't see anything right away. So I'll have to look into that because I'm actually interested in who the Brother Adams are. Now, folks, if you have actually seen our comments, our Twitter comments, these are really people's Twitter comments. However, we have removed their names and such uh, for their privacy. Um, but we figured it would be cool to show you. Next comment we have is... Better than procedural generation would be a good map editor. I'd love to recreate my city in Zomboid if I got a chance to, or got the chance to. Now, this is actually a question to Project Zomboid modders. If you watch this uh, live stream or even uh, the video, does actually Project Zomboid provide a good map editor? Or how, what's the process on that? It would be an interesting thing to actually discuss. Because this person seems to think, Jarl, that there isn't a good map editor. I think good is the keyword because I know there is a map editor. I amphibious uh or I'm sorry, ambiguous amphibian was talking about it on his YouTube video once about how he wanted to get back into map editing with Project Zomboid, was discussing his ideas. They're all really good ideas. It would be nice to see. But I think we're not going to see that from content creators as much as we'll see that from modders. Content creators just don't have the time uh, to create a map that is as in-depth as current Kentucky, uh, Knox County feels. However, I know that there is a map editor because I've heard multiple YouTubers talk about it. But a good map editor is key. For example, Bethesda, you have the Fallout map editor. You can actually make your own levels and stuff built into the game. But it is so complex to use, they don't really describe it. There's not a whole lot of tutorials. And when you make something that's hard to use, I think that's where that qualification for being a good map editor comes from. Very, very true. I know, uh, I, case in point, and a little bit off topic, but DayZ has its own map creation tool uh, for placing objects and stuff. 
and it's shit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it really is. But thankfully, a modder did make a better map editor, uh, or a better map placement editor, I should say, because you're more placing buildings and other stuff on the pre-existing maps than you are necessarily building a map. But it's still a very handy tool for building upon Shinars itself. Um, so yeah, I totally see your point there. Now, the question here is, based off of all this community feedback, Jarl, do you think that they actually favor handcrafted or procedural? The community itself, not Indie Stone. I think the community right now is favoring the idea of procedural maps, but I also think that's because they're bored. You know what I mean? Like, they're whenever the map is expanded on or new locations are put in, it's fire. Everybody's excited. But I think that people get hooked on Project Zomboid and they play it a lot. If it's not their sole game they play, whenever they get sucked back into it, like Ambiguous Amphibian and a lot of the other people who do survival games, there's a long stint where they're just on Project Zomboid, but then they get kind of burned out. Uh, and I feel that has a lot to do with the fact that there's only really, unless you go on unofficial maps, there's only really one map. It would be nice to see Project Zomboid release a Livonia or Namals, you know, have different options for you to go to that is actually made by them. Uh, Lieutenant General Zombie says an amazing map tool is Arma 3, but a bit complex, but you can create your own magical paradise. 100% agree. And I understand why the complexity is there. I went through level design courses. I get it. I really do. But with things like Unreal Tournament or the Unreal Engine um, offering you that what you see is what you get drag and drop in, I don't understand why more games don't manipulate that. No, and that's that's very true, and it can really enhance a ability to spice things up, like you said, to also not only allow your players to play off stream and everything else, but also your content creators to essentially quickly place or build things. Again, folks, we don't know if there is a good map editor for Project Zomboid, but it is an interesting comment that we saw on Twitter, and the conversation overall is pretty good. So, folks, we have done quite a bit this episode. We talked about detailed map placement and map building by hand, and we talked about procedural generation. These concepts are vastly, vastly in-depth, and there is no way we can cover both of these subjects in one episode, right, Yarl? Like, just no way. I agree. Whenever you're talking, I mean, I would go as far to say it's map theory or level theory. You know what I mean? Anytime you bring up level theory, it can go on and on and on because that it gets everybody's creative juices flowing. Uh, it, this is definitely something we'll revisit in the future for sure. It, yeah, and that's very true. We will definitely revisit this. And folks, also remember that this kind of subject is really important to us to talk about because these are kind of the things that really bring out the in-depth, I would say, exploration and feeling of wonder in video games, where you feel like every time you pick it up to replay it or whatever else, you have things to redo or rediscover. But whether it's a hand-placed map design, finding new locations you've never been to, or there's updates where there's new lore, magazines, that kind of stuff, or procedural generation where every time you boot up the world in a new game or whatever else, it's entirely different for you to explore. These are the things that give the wonder and amazement to these games. Now, next week, we are going to be actually covering Day Z, and it's going to be one heck of a fun episode because you know what? Gotta love talking about Day Z when we can. But Folks, I hope you all have a wonderful time. Ta-ta for now. Adios. Well, folks, thank you very much for watching our video and this podcast episode. Please like and subscribe, and it definitely helps us when you do. Please remember that you can also comment down below, and who knows, maybe we'll read or talk about your comment in our next episodes. Folks, I also want you to make sure to thank our staff members, being Yarla Goats and Red Falcon. Yarla Goats streams on Twitch quite regularly, and Red Falcon is responsible for the Red Falcon hel heli mods on the Daisy Workshop on PC. We are happy to have you folks here, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.